Woo! We're back again, guys. The whole crew is here. It's and another... now we're back from outer space. Let's Sorry. restart. Here we go. Hey, we're back. We'll cut that in, in post. Uh, we're Always back. edit. Always edit. Hey, um, our production team, all the editors, we'll just cut that guy out. And just, you could just put a line right here and just chop that. That'd be great. Um, this is another episode of Conversations About God. The guy over there is David Bowden. This one... His name, given at birth. We Casey don't, Stagg. We don't actually know if it was given That's at birth. True. Were you born? I don't know. Or did you manifest I yourself know. into reality? I don't know. We'll talk about that today. Who's that guy? This guy is Ryan McKenzie. How's it going, guys? Uh, if you're watching this online, uh, good to see you. Because I can see you right now. I know what you're doing. You better get... Um, Casey's got some good questions for us today. <laughs> actually, we had some people text some, uh, some tough questions we might get to at the end. Um, if you guys have questions and you want to be a part of the conversation... Um, text one of us if you have our number or just comment on um, YouTube or Facebook wherever you see this uh, if you're on if you're online on a podcast p- uh, platform any of those podcast places that you can listen to words come out of your phone then uh, just uh, email us uh, my email is Ryan at Northwest Orlando if you have questions you want us to tackle we will uh, we will tackle them we might not answer them but we will wrestle with them um, and if you hit the like and subscribe button then ten thousand dollars will immediately appear in your bank account big fireworks go off it's Boom. really cool you should do Boom. it um, we talked about that last week the NCAA sponsorships now we're open to sponsorships it's a really big deal where it's we're allowed to it's legal it's big um, that's not because we're college athletes we're col- it makes sense well, one of are. us one of us was yeah. very mediocre college athlete <laughs> The other two realized they should bow out when they did, and they did it gracefully. <laughs> Another one held on way too long. <laughs> I think our batting average was the same. I didn't even play it. <laughs> I don't know if you're saying I batted zero or a thousand, but uh, it was neither of those. I never <laughs> did see you get a hit, so it's all speculation. You did. You never came to my game. Oh never. man! Actually, I did. I tell you what. That's this not true. I came. Cool to stat. Games. You guys want to hear something cool? Grace McKenzie. Formerly Grace Lynch and I went to Rollins College at the same time, which is a big plus for me. But she sang the national anthem at a baseball game that I played at. She sang the national anthem. I hit a home run. Is that a statistic? It's a statistic. <laughs> it's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. You hit a home run during the game? That game. Oh, okay. yes. Did you ask her to sing the national anthem at every game? Yeah, <laughs> heck yeah. She would not do it. But I, um, she yeah. didn't. She didn't want you to succeed. Yeah, I blame her. Like, if it wasn't for that, I'd be in the majors right now. <laughs> okay, let's get to it. Um, if we you weren't a... so selfish, Grace, and you would just sing all the time. Let's make this whole talk about Grace McKenzie's right, selfishness and let's how do she it. doesn't Come want me to be a pro athlete, right? Time to beat her up. Also, here's the thought before we get into this. We had a really cool sermon on Sunday, um, just challenging about why people leave the church. Before we get to that, I'm watching the Olympics a little bit. And I was talking to my brother-in-law, and we agree. Like, it's amazing to see these guys, like, break world records, and these girls do incredible things, right? They're just, like, really amazing athletes. But it kind of, out of perspective, it's, like, it's just tough to know how good they are. So they should do, like, one of two things, right? Randomly pull someone out of the crowd to compete in that event with no experience at all, just so you can see what, how good that, like, if you see, like, Dressel, like, breaking the world record in the 50-meter freestyle or whatever, in comparison, and just an average person throw Dave him. out in the pool and have him swim and just see how much faster he actually uh, it looks is. looks like this man's drowning. <laughs> Dressel's actually circling back to save him. Or, the Olympics is, like, failing financially. Like, countries don't want to take it on. Like, they've lost, like, $800 million or something. So, instead of the Olympics where these guys are competing and training for it, what if every four years you did like a, a draft, random for every country, you just randomly? Like, just, you're gonna do the javelin. You're gonna do just the proper sampling of your country yes, and their completely random. Goals. You just throw them in random events. Go. I just, think I would actually enjoy that. Would be that so more. fun. It's it's either that or all drug Olympics. You can use any substance whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, let's see what the human body is capable that. of. It's not it's everything's natural. It's if the entire good. universe is just natural, oh my! It's gosh. all natural. Sorry. Oh my gosh! All right, Casey, you got questions for us? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, transitioning into that, uh, easy. So Ryan talked about uh, the the new sermon series. So, like many of you guys know, we like to discuss what the sermon was at our church the the previous Sunday. So we have entered the month of August, and it's all about reaching the next generation. So. Pastor Peter had a uh, sermon this last week that um, 
It was based out of, out of a book. You guys remember what the book? You lost me, something like that. It was a book. Anyway, he pulled out pulled out six six arguments that uh, young people have and the reasons they give for leaving the church. So we kind of went one by one, and, and he talked about them. Now we're going to talk about talk about them. So the first question is: um, Churches seem overprotective. How That's, would we respond to that? That wasn't a question. How would we respond? That is a question. Yeah. Okay. Why'd you cut me out? Comma. <laughs> comma. <laughs> How would you respond to that question? You're swinging too quickly. <laughs> it's a curveball. Yeah. It? yeah. So it's a, it's a question. It's a great transition from the Olympics. I like this a lot. <laughs> so the church seems overprotective. Um, again, this is someone who has left the church and the reason they're giving is because it seems overprotective. How would how should we respond to a young person who brings that up in conversation? Mm. Uh, well, I, th- I think it can be true that the church can be overprotective. I also think that the church should be protective. So it's, it's kind of, instead of like going right after this person and bashing them, um, I would say you, it, there's a lot more questions that need to, to open up that like what was their personal experience with that because it could very well be the case that and and this has happened in the world before that a church started acting cult-like as far as its control over people i know people that have come out of those experiences and they're like yeah i mean they they just kind of like you cut yourself off from the world and you're just in this little echo chamber and like you're not allowed to go and it just it gets bad and weird so that is true that Mm -hmm. that can happen um, so I would say I want to hear more about your experience if that person levels that yeah. you know, at us. And then I would also go, um, it shouldn't be that the church isn't protective because we are trying to protect innocence, life. Um, we're trying to uh, you know, encourage personal holiness and growth, which comes into you, you have to protect certain things. Right. So that it should be an open conversation, but not one that says, I will never go to church because they're protective. Well, you don't have comprehensive knowledge of all churches right. either. So that's there's gotta good, be one that's gotta struck a good balance. Yeah, That's a good thought. The, this, the church as a whole, I think we take our one experience and we'll say, oh, the church I went to, it. yeah, yeah. And like, so all churches must be like that. It's like, I went to school and I had a bad teacher, so all teachers are bad, or my, my parents weren't great, so all parents must not be great. Like. To the fact that we say something is overprotective, or that we call something bad, like has to mean there is a good of it, right? There has there's something we're holding that against that we'd want it to be like. So I think that's um, it's interesting. I like the argument like protection can be good, right? We want to protect people from bad things. Um, so I, I want to know what what that means. What do you mean by overprotective? Is right. that like someone like made you do something you didn't want to do or stopped you from doing stuff you didn't want to do that was actually okay and good or they suggest it or did they just suggest hey i think you're going down a path that's going to lead you away from god and that person mm-hmm. took that as like how dare you speak into my life at all like if that's what they mean by overprotective i'm kind of okay with it if, if they're like saying you can't do this you can't watch this you can't be a part of this you can't talk to these people you can't eat these foods you can't do this on yeah especially like, on gray areas yeah. yeah on things that are not biblical or not like defined clearly by jesus then it's like yeah they, they, it is overprotective and we don't want to be that so right. it's interesting to see like there's churches it's so interesting that you could so quickly be yeah. legalistic and religious mm-hmm. or think well i don't want to offend anybody and just so quickly be very liberal in your theology not politically but just like the bible can mean whatever you want it to mean and it can right. be you're free to think whatever you want to think about it. Like, we don't want to be either of those. I want to follow what the Bible says. Right. And that, that, that yeah. some people will take that as overprotective, I think, because they don't want to follow what the Bible says. But right. it's it's interesting to talk through that and find out what they really mean by what they really desire in their life. Like, so you're saying you want me to just sit back here and let you do whatever you want, even if I see you jumping into a pit that's going to hurt you. You don't want me to mention that to you. Yeah. It's, I, I don't know that that's good for anybody, you know? Right. Like that's. Yeah, and we've talked about this particular thing on the show before, like the, we all have benefited from being under someone's authority and like having that person, giving them the freedom to speak into our life, right? That's kind of where it comes from, where if someone's imposing that and you're not asking for it, then I can see that rubbing sure. people the wrong way. Right. But if you're a believer and you're obedient to what the word says, where it says submit to authority, right? And it's, it's talking about within the church and outside of the church, but specifically within the church, um, if you're giving that person freedom, you're really what you're saying is tell me something that 
is going to rub me the wrong way because my natural instinct is going to lead me into sin or lead me down the wrong path. So you're putting that person in place in your life to keep you on the right path. So can't, has that been abused historically within church? I'm sure, I'm sure it has, sure. right? But to your point, we can't, yeah. we can't make that a generalization. Even um, that word authority is like... It rubs tough, people the wrong like, way, yeah. And it, even in a well-meaning relationship, it can still get rough. Because like, if my authority is not ultimately... Like if I'm asking you, hey, will you help me with this? And your goal is to like be that authority in my life and be that accountability in my life. And you're, it, it starts off good, but like it will eventually end bad if it's not your goal is to point me to what Jesus says. Right. And Jesus has the ultimate authority. Right? right. Like if it's just us, that's you can work out like don't do this, don't and put boundaries and all that stuff, which is a good start sure. but it doesn't ultimately point to Christ and what he wants is the ultimate authority right that's, that's that's good when we bring it to Christ I would say anybody who's dealing with that that question of church being overprotective I would say go read the Sermon on the Mount as you're digesting right. what protection should look like and like consider that maybe the person that's maybe warned you or said hey I, I don't think you should do that go to the Sermon on the Mount and go is this person more protective than Jesus <laughs> or or less and, and like because he's the litmus test and if you read the Sermon on the Mount he puts some hard lines in the sand as far as what to allow in your life and if it doesn't fall under the Sermon on the Mount as far as like yeah this is just a good starting point you know like go all right then it's a, a peripheral and maybe I shouldn't be you know so I got an overprotective story that um like me and my wife maybe it could be called overprotective for this just to like um, we canceled Netflix in our house we have like five kids that are all under teenage years, right? And there's some stuff on there we're realizing, man, they had, even on the kids' profile, like, the first season's really great, the second season, all of a sudden, something rough happens, sexually or morally, or just stuff that we didn't agree with. I'm like, I don't want them to find out about this stuff through a cartoon, you know? I don't think, even if it was stuff that I agreed with and it was done a different way, I don't think you should be talking about those topics for five-year-olds or for four-year-olds. And I want to be the one that brings it up along their paths they grow. And I want to have purpose conversations. So in a way, are we being overprotective? Yeah, I want to make sure that I protect the way they receive that information. Not that they never receive it, but that we can guide that conversation um, and not just throw them to the wolves and say, well, I saw this guy kissing a guy. What does that mean? What's going on? I thought, I thought what is that? why would that happen? And they're confused and don't understand. I saw something else. I saw something else. I heard this word. I heard that thing. I saw somebody kill somebody. Like what? It, like that. That stuff stays with you when you just see it for the first time on your own, True. rather than at the right time with someone that you trust that is protecting you, showing you, and talking you through it. So, you, yeah. on the surface, you could say, "Man, you don't let your kids watch Netflix." That seems overprotective. But if we have a conversation about it, that's not really what it is. It's there's more sure. to it, and we're going to talk through like how to bring it up and how to like. I want my kid to know about stuff in the world, yeah. but the right way, the right time, and yeah. on from there, right? So, so my wife and I, I, I did not grow up in the church, she did, and so she she under, or grew up experiencing pr- being protected from mm-hmm. a lot of things. Some things probably overprotected, some things very thankful that she was protected from, right. and I'm like the opposite end of the spectrum. Same. So like the conversation is lively when we talk about like what's allowable, what isn't, and I, I think a good rule is always, at least within a family unit, is to go, always kind of cater to the one who feels more strongly about not allowing something in and, and like let that be the start of maybe discussing allowing things in for example yeah. cartoons right i was allowed to watch any cartoon uh, you know available it's a cartoon it's for kids it's okay Dave. you know right, right? It's okay. so i think there are some cartoons that are bad influences on children like teaching bad behaviors right. and like rebellion against authority figures in the life like that's not stuff i want to encourage but like I remember like talking with my wife about Care Bears, and this is something Pastor Mark or Pastor Peter brought up at a church, and he stole that from me. That's plagiarism, and uh, the example of like, you know, I'm like, I, I said to my wife, I'm like, what's wrong with the Care Bears? <laughs> like, <laughs> isn't caring a biblical thing? And then even like directionally at people because the care shooting bears, care out of your chest. It's <laughs> it, they, they harnessed all their care directionally, and I'm like. <laughs> That's sinful, isn't it? I'm like, it's not. It's not. Bad. So, like, I, I go there, but there are it's a other... a great argument. You're, that's one argument. I, I think I'd, I'd fight. I, I think, think it's, it's the best argument I've ever made about any subject is Care Bears. Um, but then, like, 
you know, we would start to start talking about other cartoons. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, maybe there were there were definitely things that I allowed that I have to now question. Go, that probably shouldn't have been in my life. But like Care Bears, I'm like, that should always be okay. <laughs> um, that's where I land. I don't know. But I, don't know. It, I think it's got to be a discussion. And if I'm not in agreement with my wife on allowing certain um, information to come to my child, then I I should cater to being on the protective end of things. Well, yeah. And so with the Care Bears, something came up this week with Muppet Babies. I don't know if y'all saw that, but it was rough, some rough stuff. I'm like, I don't, this is meant for two-year-olds and, and two to five-year-olds. Yeah. I don't my, I don't want my two and three-year-old kids to, like, this, this is just going to, they're not going to question it. They're just going to sure. be like, this is, oh, this is normal. This is what kids do. And I, so I, I don't know if, this is like a, some people think it's a targeted pursuit of our kids and this is what we, they want to push an agenda. I'll, that could be the case. And I think other things are like the way our culture is and the way the world is right now is like a lot of people writing shows and producing shows. Like if you don't have certain things in them, then you're not going to be on for the next season because you want to be culturally acceptable to things. Sure. So like it's just the, the fallout is our kids see things that maybe too soon, you know, yeah. and probably too much. So that's, and that's something to think about. Like, and it, well, yeah, I'm still thinking through this because I've got now my three oldest little, daughter. Yeah, my yeah. oldest daughter is really into watching not not cartoons anymore, but like kids shows that were like the real kids. You know, the Disney shows where the kids yeah. hate the parents or the parents are dead. One of the two. You know, it's like that's all the and so like parents are always dead. They're, they're, they're stupid kids. or they're dead. Like that's yeah. all. <laughs> but they're funny and they're fun. The kids have a good time. My daughter and I laugh. We watch them together sometimes, and then we noticed that like all of a sudden she's getting really disrespectful and she's like kind of talking back and she's lying about things or whatever it was. You know, and I was like. This happened when we started watching this. Okay, let's take this away yeah. and see what happens. And all of a sudden, that influence isn't there. So, hey, guess what? You don't get to watch. This is, I'm, it's a fun, Living Maddie. It's a funny show. It's nothing that I saw wrong with it, but it just impacts different kids in different ways. So, we don't get to watch that right now. Yeah. We'll come back and watch it later when you can control, you, have, you can show me you have self control. You know? And that That's, speaks to being involved with your kid and seeing yeah. and noticing and, and like, I see what you're watching. I'm seeing a behavior that's not good. And it's, discernment's got to be because here's the thing I'm I've got three little ones in my house now and like it, I'm still figuring this stuff out so I like that this is a discussion we're having it because yeah. it's making me go home and go alright what am I allowing in my house that is am I, where am I being overprotective where do I need to kind of tighten the reins well, so another another point that um, kids have brought up our young people for leaving the church have brought up is they believe and it kind of ties into what we're talking about they think church is boring right yeah. so I can see what we're talking about being a result of them not getting what they want or them being protected and saying well this is just boring you know I'm not allowed to do what I want and I think what they believe or what the church has realized is that young people's experience with God can be shallow so if someone came up to you and said well church is just boring that's why I left what, what would you guys say to that? And Church again, is boring. That's I, why I left. Yeah, and I again, I get we're taking general things. This is. Well, I've had this. This is actually big because I think the same thing with um, it's overprotective, like or it's boring. Like what would what would how why'd you right. feel that way, right? Like if it and same thing with being overprotective. Like if it's just like a, a line in the sand, you can't do this. Um, it's gonna be. Feel that way it's going to feel boring but there's no conversation if we don't bring young people not just my kids as we're parenting it's not just for parents but like if we don't bring young people to the table and we don't bring them into the conversation and let them have a say in the way we worship or have them have a say in the way we minister the way we teach or the events that we put on and they're not a part of putting these things together and having ownership in it when they're young mm -hmm. then it's gonna be boring right so i think that's i think that that one could be a legitimate thing to me is like, it can be hard to understand the Bible. It can be hard to pray. It can be hard to get into worship music when everybody else around you is listening to other music, doesn't pray. The Bible sounds different than the stories that I read or the movies that I watch. Like it, it's hard for somebody who hasn't grown up in that culture to get into it. It can be tough. Mm -hmm. So if we don't bring them into leadership meetings, if we don't bring them into like what we're going to do mm -hmm. in kids' church, in middle school night, it high school night, even on Sunday mornings, like, um, Pastor Jared's got a middle school, a couple middle schoolers up there playing in the band. Like, that's the, that's a start of what's, what could really be really cool in our yeah, church, and right. I think other churches could grab onto as well. It's like, are, do we have, are they represented in leadership? Are they represented in, um, ideas and events that we have? Are they thought of as somebody there saying, no, the kids want this, and it really has a pulse on right. what they like, um, 
not just not just like, hey, can we make it fun for them? Can we have big flashy lights and cool music for them? Because I don't think the church can ever compete. Maybe maybe it can in some way, but I don't think you can ever compete with. We live in Orlando, right? Like Disney. Like you can't compete with Disney. You can't compete with going out and doing crazy stuff with your friends or, or going on a boat and water skiing or tubing or whatever. Like, there's just so, so much. You can't just reproduce yeah. that. In, but you can give them real life stuff. You can know like that this is not just a phony life. This is like real conversations, you, real healing, real like fun, real people, not just everything's fake and big and just entertainment, but like right. you're a part of this and you're building it with us. Right. Like that is yeah. that that makes it amazing to me. Right. It's, so so you guys are parents and you get to interact with your kids a lot more than someone who's not their parents, right? So as church leaders here, people are trying to influence young people and keep them in church and fall in love with Christ and surrender their life to Christ. What do we have to do? Because what you're talking about is finding something that's in them and pulling it out, right? So um, yeah. what do we have to do as people who don't live with these kids? How can we identify those things in them and pull it out to make them come alive and kind of release that thing that God has placed in them, right? Like God has yeah. placed something uniquely in each one of these kids. It's, I don't think it's a general thing where we, to your point, can just yeah. make church fun, but we have to like speak to the thing that's inside of each one of these kids. So how do we do that? You guys get to do it with your kids because you're around them constantly, right? And you can, you have more opportunity to speak into their life. But for a kid who maybe just comes on Sundays or comes to group once a week, how can we do that? to pull, first recognize it and then know how to kind of pull that out of them. Um, I would say absolutely, first and foremost, try to connect with them outside of church, yeah. outside of the church setting. Like get creative with uh, having lunch or like going and do an experience because it's when you go and experience life that you actually get to know a person. Yeah. Um, some, some people, probably younger people, are coming in with an impression of what church is supposed to be like and they've have their best Show behavior up, sit down and all and that. And like, like I don't want to see you on your best behavior. I want to see you as you. And the right. only way I can do that is let's have a meal. Let's go do some things. Let, let me see you in a stressful situation. Let me see you in a joyful situation. And, and that will show me what's there right. and like how I can encourage you or like speak to things. And kind of going back to the question originally, like if, if the, if the critique is church is boring, it's like, well, what, what is your view of what church ought to be? If it's to be entertained, that's not the, the purpose of church. Um, but if it's to, exp like, not not entirely. I, I do think you should do things to keep people's attention and win people in. And, like, there's an evangelistic aspect to it that I totally see. But I would say the, the purpose of church is to live authentic, real life. And if hmm. that's not happening and real conversations aren't happening and we're not actually letting people into our lives, then, yeah, it'll be boring. It's just like... Is putting on a good face. Like, I want you to see my scars and warts and all. And then that's that's actually interesting. <laughs> you're like, wow, you, you said that. And I've even had conversations where people are like, you're not afraid to talk about anything. I'm like, why should I be? You know, like, I want to talk about life as it actually is, not like what it ought to be. And like, mm -hmm. and, and, and like, let's pretend like we're all okay. We're not all okay. <laughs> we're all a bunch of screwed up people meeting together talking about life. Yeah. And yeah. if people, young people see that, they're like, deep down, they know they're, they're screwed up. And they need help. And if they see that we're actually acknowledging that, they'll want to be welcomed into that. Okay. And there's fun. So if you take the question, like if it's an honest question, and you take it at face value, like church is boring. If it really is, then it's our fault, right? Yeah. Like, like the number of parents I've talked to that are like, or, or small group leaders that I've talked to, and, and like the, the question, the, the conversation kind of goes, like, this is like not just, this is a bunch of people. Where in our church and other churches, was like, how do you get, your kids to like church? How do you get your, your group to be excited about the gospel? How do you get your kids to pray with you? I'm like, do you pray? You know, are you, are you excited to pray? Are you excited? Do you go to a group? Are you excited for a group? Like, do you come to your group that you lead with like, you're just fired up for it? And it's like, gonna be, not that you have to be like some extroverted, crazy psychopath like I am sometimes, but like, but like, are you fired up for what God wants to do in the, your kids' lives or your group's lives or the people in this church's lives? Like, do you come on Sunday morning expecting something awesome to happen? Or is it like, well, there's a bunch of kids here. I hope they get excited today. You know, right? 
oh, here's my group over here. They come to church sometimes. I hope they give something out of worship. I'm just going to stand right here. Like, are you leading the way with excitement and joy and passion and zeal? Are you actually excited for that? Because if we're not, then the people we're trying to lead, they're going to look at me and be like, oh, that's what a mature Christian is, or that's what um, that you're, you're always just stoic, and you're always just calm, and you just, yeah, the sermon was okay today, or worship well, it was kind of off-key, or it was kind of this, or it's kind of like, no, like, we get to meet with the holy God of the universe who made everything. We get to talk to Him. We get to, like, God lives inside of you and you, and we get to, like, talk to each other. Like, we, this is the most incredible meeting that maybe has ever happened right now for me because I get to talk with you and God is in you. Like, this is, like, exciting stuff. Yeah. And if we don't believe that as parents, as leaders, as people who are trying to pull the next generation in, then how can we ever expect them to think that? Like, if they do, then now they're leading the church because we're, we're just sitting back and going, yeah, well, they're excited, they're kids, and they can... They just go wherever they want, but then there's no direction, and then we complain about it, so it just ruins their anyway. Yeah, I it's, remember. Uh, I remember being in like fired up, man, like, being a youth and seeing somebody. You were never a, a youth. Look at you. How old are you? I've not always been this age. How are you? Fifty seven. I'm no longer that age. Yeah. I just got older. Um, so I remember when I was a a youth, a youth. Um, <laughs> Duh bear. Duh. Wow. Duh bear. Duh bear. Being um, like, so yeah, I was, I was after having fun and all that stuff, and I was coming to church and I was interested in the social aspect of things, but I remember being invited into, like you said it earlier, like invite them into meetings and into leadership thing, like let, let them see behind the curtain, like this is what actually goes yeah. on. And I remember like watching somebody be moved by the gospel or moved by something that they had learned about Jesus and they just were moved to tears and they were changed. And I saw them change in front of my face and I was like, oh, this is, this is important and I, I need to be around this. And that kind of like, that making those connection points is so much more important than the, the it being boring or not because that's not boring. Yeah. I just saw somebody like completely change in front of me in a certain area of their life and I'm like wow that's interesting yeah that's more interesting than going and being entertained and so like as many of those connection points we can make for people that's tremendous Good. like I have anchor points I can remember where I was how old I was when I saw these events happen and I'm like I need that yeah I love uh, the points that we're talking about here because I'm the product of not my own father leading me to Christ right but a man of God who had his own family but kind of yeah. brought me into his his family but we had a ton of fun right and that is what initially drew me to him it wasn't like oh look at that guy yeah. man i want to just go hang out with him but it was no that guy's having fun like i want to be around him right and since i was around him he preached the gospel to me and he lived an authentic life which is what yeah. you guys are talking about and he didn't just say hey casey go do this but it was hey casey let's do this together right and he He's witnessed to more people than I've ever seen, right? And he's got the zeal, he's got yeah. the love for God, and it's contagious, right? And it really helped shape me as a youth. But without that, who knows what, what the result would have been. Not And there are different ways that people come to God. I'm not saying that at all. But he lived it with me, right? He didn't just say, hey, this is how I live yeah. my life. You go do it. But it, I was with him. We yeah. had fun. That's what drew me in initially. So It's almost like you feel like, when we talk about this, like, well, should we preach the gospel and have church for youth or should we entertain them and have fun with them? And I was like, that's not the two options. Right. Like, the gospel yes, is both. fun. Yes. Your life should just be fun because you're filled with joy right. and you want to do fun things. You want to, like, it's an adventure. You know, mm -hmm. like, it's not just like, well, now, now kids, it's Bible study time. So we're going to sit down and you're going to sit here and pray with me and read the Bible, whether you like it or not. Like, no. And make it fun. Like that should be who we yeah. are. Like, we have more reason to have fun than anyone on the planet. Right. Here, okay. Next question here, um, Casey. Church churches seem antagonistic to science. Well, science isn't real. What are your thoughts on that? That's the question. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> How would you respond? Making a statement. <laughs> science isn't real. I don't see science. The Earth is flat. Um, We're just you had a, so you had a, honestly. This is a real thing. So is this conversation. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, guy in Casey's group. We won't say names. Send him a text saying, hey, I saw this on TikTok. Um, they're using Bible verses to back up why they think the earth is flat. Um, and it's like, what do you think? It's confusing to me. I don't know. Like, So they, we can maybe go that route with like... Uh, yeah, so I watched it and I was confused too. So I'm probably going to have to watch it. I watched it. I think the girl who said it was confused. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do think that um, 
the thought in the world and amongst young people is to your point talking about the gospel and fun like that you can't have both right it's like well you can't have church and science but huh. yes you do you can like the the bible talks about science and this thing in particular she was using verses that are poetic and were making them scientific right and pastor peter even made that point the first chapters in the bible are not scientific they are poetic mm -hmm. and she was kind of doing the same thing there which gets scary when you're taking scripture out of context you don't know what is really sure. being said and you're building a truth based on that when it was never designed to be that way right. so um i think first we Science is such a big thing, and there's so many different aspects of it. And just like all these topics, we have to identify the specific thing that they're bringing because up. Because science. Talking. Right. See? Yeah, it's so general. <laughs> so we need to really talk about what part of science are you having an issue with, and do you think the Bible is you know, contradicting or whatever it may be. So tough question, but definitely yeah. something that you've got to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with and get to details and specifics yeah. of why they're bringing that up. I love the point in his sermon and this is the science thing just we can get into stuff where we're i'm not a scientist and we get like all of a sudden we start arguing things that become ultimate things in our argument and we're like no this is what happened this is how it happens this and like okay if we just take a step back like i might really believe that's what happened but if it didn't does it change the gospel and he said well, no it doesn't so why do i even care to argue that with someone who thinks that's a thing and thinks right. that's a, a stumbling block to come to church like right. hey i'll give you that just take you can whatever that scientific thing is like there's no such thing as gravity okay um sure you take that and but jesus still is real right, <laughs> right? so yeah. let's talk about him right. <laughs> how he floated around <laughs> whatever you whatever you want to talk yeah. it, it could be as ridiculous as that but like you know yeah it does it impact you. right the belief in the gospel and then you take it like whatever yeah. and we can we can have little conversations and we can talk about why truth is important and why things are reality is important. But right. like, I don't I, know if that's the hill I'm going to die on the first day I meet somebody sure. and like why you're leaving. I, that's... I think it's true that there are many Christians who are anti-science. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. But the thing that makes me go, this is such a non-issue for me. Like I see how it's an issue for some people as they're looking at the church and, and like critiquing it or judging it that people could go, oh, there's a lot of people that are anti-science. Sure, that's always going to be the case that somebody is like trying to wear the the clothes of Christianity and they're wearing them poorly, right? Like they're trying, like people always will misrepresent what good thought is. But I look I go and I look at every scientific discipline and I find Christians deeply um, embedded in those disciplines and it's they they have no issue saying Christ is king, he is my Lord, and man, microbiology is so super interesting, and they're yeah. doing scientific research and work. And I go, okay, if these very brilliant people have no problem with doing ha handling both and actually find a lot of harmony within them, I go, okay, then it's it's not that Christians are anti-science. Some of them are. Sure. And, and engage with them on that. Like, have good debates. I, I say do that. But... Um, I do not see, first of all, the Bible is not a book of science. It, it is not intended to speak about science largely. Does it say scientific things? Absolutely. It confirms but its main, some scientific things. It, its yeah. main agenda is not science. So that we have developed a discipline as we have gone on as human beings of science, which is the study of knowledge, great. How is that contrary? I don't see it. And, and the Bible doesn't have contradictory statements about the natural order of things. Like, I, I've, I've studied it, scrutinized it, and I don't see that. It's not contradicting science, but it's not mainly about it. So I, I, I think you got to look at it healthily that way. It's not a book of science. It says some things, you know, scientifically yeah. that you can prove, yeah. but it's not a book of science. That's yeah. good. Do you want to put a fork on in it? On, on it. On top of it. Um, for these three and maybe... Uh, a fork on it. Just lay uh, how about a trident? <laughs> tackle like a tackle the other three next week. Let's put a pin in it and we'll circle back. You can't make a mistake in this room. It is exposed. It's shark like tank. Shark. Yeah, sharks with blood in the water. But we did get a... Uh, yeah. You got really close to me yeah, there. Let's get real close to talking about this. <laughs> we hope it's going around. We you actually did, did get a question. Um, because we do this podcast solely because of that, right? No other reason why we got to... Say who, who asked this or no? No, no. Okay. Just a, a, a young person in our church who 
um, is a believer, loves God, like serving the Lord. Great, great. 13 to 19 years old. 13 to 19, yeah. Handsome young man. Handsome young Whoa. man. <laughs> We're getting specific here. Yeah. Specific. Um, but anyway, asked a, asked a question, which is a great a great question, and I, I'm glad he, he texted it in. It's it looks a really, very long. It's a long question, but um, really the what it comes down to, all these words can be summed up. Words good. Yeah. Is uh, are we... Are we promised earthly blessings? Are we promised wealth? Are we promised prosperity because we're Christians? Um, and is it no. in the will of God that every Christian is to be blessed and to, to have these Christian. things? So what do you guys think? I think absolutely unequivocally yes. Ooh. No doubt in my mind because heaven is going to be here on earth and we're going to be blessed beyond imagination. Yes. So that it will 100% be one absolutely true when at the resurrection when we're all when that's all settled. It's like that the end is going to be so so like dripping with it. blessing. It's going to be unbelievable. Now, what's your time frame on it, right? Like right. So yeah. I go ultimately 100% in this life that's that's a good question. You know what's amazing? When you're, question. In, when you're in seventh grade, I was talking about something the other day, or even sixth grade, and you meet a fifth grader, you're like, what a little kid. What a t- like, I'm so much older. And then all of a sudden, you're in like high school, and like your year apart is not as big a deal. College, not as big. And like now, like you're 10, 15 years apart from somebody. It's like you're friends. It's, there's no difference in age, it feels like. I think the same thing applies to a lot of the promises in the Bible and a lot of the stuff that we read is like, is this true? Like, well, yes, but not maybe not right now for you. Maybe in eternity. Maybe 10 years from now. Maybe 20 years from now. Sure. Maybe you are called to have incredible financial blessings in your life. And God wants you to use that in a big way. Or maybe you're going to be really poor. And God wants to use that in an amazing way. Um, but in the end, His presence and His blessing and eventually all kinds of physical blessing as well forever. Um, but it's like we have this limited view right now on earth that like our life is just such a vapor just so quick that we like think it's got to happen now or else it's never going to happen mm-hmm. i think that's probably the first thing to check on like am i expecting that like you're a genie come on out right now give me my blessing or mm-hmm. is this in your timing god you know yeah. that's yeah i think it we really have to assess our heart right because jesus dying on the cross and giving us the free gift of salvation that should be all we need that that is a tremendous blessing correct like the biggest yeah. the the best gift, gift we could ever receive right and if we find ourselves dwelling on anything other than that it's indicative of where our heart's at right and it shows like hey i want wealth here and we see people here on earth who are filthy rich and they're not believers right and it our minds can easily go there like well why does god bless them there and not and not me here right but our mind is really getting off of christ and the cross and the ultimate gift like this is just a breath we're here so really what does money matter right yeah eternally speaking right um so i think we have to always assess when that thought creeps in we have to assess like man am i am i elevating earthly things above the cross and our the sacrifice that christ made for me yeah i just i like as we're saying this i agree 100 percent. and i'm also thinking like man there hasn't been a time when i have prayed and God hasn't blessed me. Like I'm just like, it, it would maybe a different way than I wanted him Can you to. Do it right now, show us. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, honestly, I was thinking that like I've prayed like like when I was training at the RDV, right? And I'm like, man, my client load is pretty low. God, I really could use some help getting more clients and more money. I I want to provide for my family. Like literally the next day or the next week, I get a new client, and it's like you could say it's because I'm working hard or because I'm getting better at my job, or whatever. But like it happened over and over again, like. I'm just like, that it, are we actually in relationship with him where we can say, hey, dad, I need something. Because he says to do that. He yeah, like, I answer. need this. Like, will you help me out? I feel I just want this. If it's your will, let it be done. Like, I, he wants to give his kids good things. He wants right. to give them to us right now. So I don't, I don't think it's prosperity gospel to say, yeah, you're going to be blessed right now. Like, you can be. But it is ultimately in his will. And it is a, a heart check. Like, do I want that more than, like, a relationship with him? Or is it out of this relationship with my dad that I'm just like, hey, dad, can you can you do this for me? Can yeah. we, like, like, that is a – to have that freedom to talk to God in that way where you know he wants what's best for you and to ask him for things and he yeah. gives it to you, that is – that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I don't think we have to settle for just settle for like, I'm saved. I'm never going to talk to you again. Thank you so much for putting up with me. And I'll just like, yeah. I'll make my way out right now until I die. And you'll never talk here for me again. Like, that's not the point of salvation. Like, he wants us to be his kids, to be with him. And he wants good things for his kids. So there's nothing wrong with asking him for stuff. But to your point, if, if he chooses that it's not best for us right now, right. or he wants us to do a little work for it right now, then great, that's what you want. And I'll, I'll defer to you because you're you're the boss and you're dad and you know what's best. So mm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna And that. sometimes the best thing for us is tough times. And it's stuff where it's Suffering not... Suffering can be a blessing. Right, right exactly. And to your point, um, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about that. Like, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. So if we are just in our life and we are struggling hmm. and... To your example, if you just went home and worried about it or talked to your wife about it and didn't pray, now we're in disobedience, right? So, like, if we're not asking God and talking to God about it, now we're we're not following his ways. We're not being obedient to our Father. So, um, I love it. I mean, I think we have to do that without a doubt. I think what I'm taking away from what you're saying is talking to your wife about things is disobedience to God. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> You know what's tough about all these? <laughs> if, if you do that and don't talk to God, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's tough about having so many questions is like any one of these questions can be an hour and a half conversation. Yeah. So we're just so you all know, like this isn't comprehensive. We'll be here for subjects. another three hours right now. This yeah. is the whole goal. But on money, the Bible has some very like um, hard things to say about how hard it is to be wealthy and enter the kingdom of God. Like mm-hmm. that's something uh, that's hmm. said. Like it's easier for um, a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven like okay that's a sobering thought so like it's a culturally relative thing to think about um, blessing in the United States versus some other countries where you, you're like am I going to eat tomorrow you know so it's like okay um, we are like eat, we live like kings and queens here in, in the United States as far as the amount of wealth that is available to us. So I, I kind of look at all of this in that. I'm wow. like, I already am the rich man. Uh, like the, the, the needle and the camel thing is like, I'm that guy. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a millionaire. But like I'm very wealthy compared to the world. And I go, okay, so the Bible says some very difficult things about what you have been given, what you're responsible for. So as much as we want to be blessed, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with being blessed. Yeah. What are you doing with it? Why do you want to be blessed? Why are you asking God for these things? But go ask Him. Right. You know, but but it's the Bible says it's difficult hmm. for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not impossible. Yeah. It says it's difficult. But it's also difficult to be a Christian. It's difficult to do a lot of what the Bible That's says. It. So I go, look at this question with sober judgment and but still go to God and ask him for things because he says to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's just going, it's going to be difficult, but it's worthwhile. Yeah. It's good stuff. Uh, We could, like you said, we could talk about this stuff all day long, but it's time. It's that time. We're going to close this up. Um, If you've got more questions, send them to us. We want to hear from you so we can tell you why you're right or why you're wrong or what the Bible says or just what Dave thinks, you know? So that's, that's really important. I think. He thinks a lot. It's good stuff. Um, We're done for the day, guys. This has been Conversations About God, and um, we'll talk more about it next week. See See ya.